I'm very flattered to be here. I, I really am. Uh, Love Darton had wonderful years here 26 years ago, had our 25th last year. And I was thinking last night driving down from DC, I remember going to several speakers like this and I remember it being a very valuable enhancement to my education. But I don't remember one specific thing they said. So I actually have a pretty simple goal today and that is to spur one or two thoughts for each of you in your time here at Darden and perhaps early in your years around general management. Uh, I've been a general manager for 21 years with two organizations. I've loved it from the day I got my first P&L to run and it's what I, what I do since. So what I have to share today is my story and my experience and again, hopefully some of that is, is helpful to you all here today. Uh, as Martin said, I have been very active in a very important initiative for us at Danaher around diversity and inclusion. And um, I, I use the word initiative very carefully because it's really just ingrained into our business and it's an area where we need to get better. So I'll share some thoughts around that. So thank you for coming today. Uh, hope the free lunch is good. So I see some orange hats out there. Uh, uh, be sure to take those with you as well. So I get asked a lot whenever I talk about general management, what is it? What, what do you do? And I like to say I run companies. I help run companies and try to make them better. And I often get quizzical looks. So do you just fly around checking on your companies? <laughs> well, I fly around a lot, but we actively manage our companies and try to make them better. And then it kind of falls, well, how do you make them better? Well, there's a handful of things we try to do to make them better. Number one is we try to help them grow, both organically and inorganically. Number two is we try to help them improve their profitability so we can reinvest in the business and keep this going. Uh, we, three, we try to improve the cash flow of the business. Uh, Danaher is a very acquisitive company and, and we invest that cash. We have the luxury and the obligation with our shareholders to put that back into our businesses both organically and, and to add companies to our portfolio. So those are some financial metrics we look to improve, but there's also some customer and associate metrics that are really important to us, such as our turnover rate, uh, with a percentage of positions that we fill from developing our people internally. Uh, for customers, our on-time delivery and our, and our quality improvement. And by the way, I just rattled off seven, there's an eighth, our return on invested capital. That's how we measure every single business at Danaher. Not just financially, but for metrics that matter for our associates and our shareholders. And that's really how I look at general management, is how do we create value for our customers, our associates, and if we do those well, we'll certainly do that for our shareholders as well. So that's kind of my simple definition of general management. And frankly, everything you'll hear from me over the next 35 minutes or so is pretty simple and straightforward. And part of that is, as I've run companies in many different industries, it really has helped force me to simplify, help bring down to th a few things that really matter in any business, in any industry. And I look forward to sharing some of that with you. So, how do you become a general manager? Obviously, you come to Darden first. Um, that's a great place to start, and I can guarantee you everyone in this room will not appreciate this education for many, many years. I'm sure you will in the next two years, but for sure, over time, that will become more evident to you. One of the messages is there is no set path to become a general manager. I have some suggestions for things you might think about, but there are lots of paths to becoming a general manager. And I'm certain there's somebody in this room that's going to go off and be a banker or go off and be something that's not general management related. That's great. You're going to be working with general managers. You might be responsible for general managers. You might be investing in general managers. So hopefully what I have to say uh, is, is relevant to you. And the reality, I would say, is for 99.9% .9 of the graduates of Darden, they're not going to go be a general manager in your first role. You're going to have some experiences. You're going to have some roles that are going to help develop you to be ready to run a business, which is really about building teams and leadership. And that is the word that I'll use many times, and that is the key 
to being a successful general manager, building teams and being a leader. So who is Dan Daniel? I, you know, for, for me to share my perspective, I need to sort of tell you who I am. Uh, you can guess which one I am in the picture. <laughs> but I have four older sisters. And I learned at an early age about diversity. I knew a long time before the book came out that men were from Mars and women were from Venus. And if that's not enough, my wife of 29 years has three older sisters. So I basically have seven older sisters, four by blood, three by marriage. I often say I've been raised by a pack of women. Uh, so I kind of understood the diversity thing early on. I grew up in southern Indiana, a little town called Columbus, pretty... A uh, unique community of 40,000. At the time, there were three Fortune 500 companies in Indiana. Two of them were in a small town in, in, in Columbus, Arvin Industries, where I spent 19 years in Cummins Engine Company. Uh, I was a diverse candidate when I came to Darden. Why? Half the school was from Virginia. Half of those folks had no idea where Indiana was, even though the, where that star is in Columbus was part of Virginia territory at one time. So I uh, grew up in a small town. Not all that diverse. Uh, I think we were 50% male, 50% female, but that was kind of where the diversity ended. Uh, I was an athlete my whole life, very competitive. I loved sports. It was, you know, all my youth was around playing sports. I was a pretty good tennis player, but I hated tennis at a certain period of time. It was an individual sport. I loved basketball, partly because Indiana, you know, that's where the glory was in Indiana, but really because it was a team sport. And I learned the importance and the satisfaction that comes from being on a team. You don't show up for work every day at 100%. You have some good days and some bad days. And when you've got teammates, they can help make your bad days better, and you can do the same. And it's a very rewarding experience, and that's had a big part of how I view my role today in building teams and developing teams and leading teams. As I said, I spent 19 years in the automotive industry. The auto parts world, pretty tough market. At one time, a very lucrative and prosperous industry. Uh, I got there in the late 80s, and the good old days were behind. But it was a tremendous training ground on the automotive service side, where selling to customers like Meineke and Midas and Pep Boys and AutoZone were really changing the way distribution was done in that, that market. Very relationship selling. Uh, very much about distribution channels going to retail and consolidation. So an incredible learning experience over those 19 years at Arvin. Shortly after college, uh, my wife of 29 years uh, last month and I were together. Uh, Chocolate Lab has been part of those 29 years as I've been running around uh, traveling. has been help, help companion. But all of us can't do what we do alone. And my wife and my family has been a big part of my success and a big part of the reason why I do what I do. Came to Darden, obviously, for two years. Learned so much at Darden. I'll talk a bit more about that in the future. The last 12 years have been at Danaher running companies, and uh, I'll, I'll share some more about that. Here's my family, three kids, 27, 25, and 20. Uh, they are the reason I do what I do. Uh, and those last two pictures are Montana, a place where I love to go as often as I can, get away from the stress, the challenges, and, and really relax. So those last few photos are at this stage in my life, in my career, really why I do what I do. So why did I share that with you? What's my story? Just like all of you have your own stories. And for you to understand where I'm coming from, you have to understand my story. So as we as organizations work together, for me to understand you and where you're coming from, I have to understand your story to the extent that I can. Obviously, with 50,000 people, you can't do that. But with you know, 100 senior leaders, it's important to do that to understand those perspectives and get in a better place. My, my general management career started just with assignments out of college. Coming to Darden, I'd had sales experience, I'd had operations experience that started on day one riding on the delivery truck on the third shift at night, understanding what the customer needs were and how those auto parts got to their place of business and what really mattered to them. Time in plants. So, Early on, my career was about sales and operations. As I came to Darden, those were the two areas where I felt like I had a, some expertise. But the two things I learned very quickly at Darden were, number one, there's a lot of smart people in that classroom, and I better work hard. And secondly is, 
it really demonstrated to me how much there is to learn in the world and in life, and a life of continuous learning is really important. Learned a lot of other things, but those still stand out very high in my mind. Coming out of Darden, where friends were going to Wall Street or consulting, I went to make mufflers in East Tennessee. And they didn't know what to do with me there, so I worked out on the line with an assembly team, where the goal was to make 1,100 mufflers in a shift and try to take that 1,100 to 1,200. And I learned in that role, working side by side with people from very different backgrounds than what I was, they're there to work hard, to do a good job, and they're trying to put their kids through college and, and live a life as well. Then I moved into sales. I was not a sales guy, but I learned the value and the importance of a quota and selling and what it takes to sell beyond just relationships, things that are still very important today. And then one day on a Saturday morning, my boss came in and said, you might ask, what are you doing there on a Saturday morning? I live very close, my desk was a mess and I was coming to clean it up. He knew I would do that occasionally and caught me and said, what would you think about going to France and being a general manager? My first thought was, oh my God, what am I gonna tell Robin? She said, let's go. Again, part of that partnership that probably wouldn't have gone if she hadn't have said, let's go. But I went to France not speaking French. Uh, I understood a little bit about business, but it was a real challenge to communicate. And the ability or the, to, to understand the challenges of not being in your native language was incredibly valuable from a guy from a small town in Indiana that had never had that challenge before. Uh, it was about distribution channels changing in Europe and having the opportunity to help build businesses with our customers. Then that became a larger responsibility where we acquired two French companies, an English company, an Italian company. And my job was to try to put those together. That's no small task. Uh, and, and learning that, again, that people have different perspectives. People have different objectives and trying to organize them for the common good of the organization. It doesn't just happen with a memo or an email. It takes a lot of work, a lot of conversation, a lot of clarification about what the value and the benefits are to people like customers, our associates, and our shareholders. Then moving on to running global businesses for, for Arvin, and eventually it became clear that these were not businesses that were part of a public company. They were more entrepreneurial. They were more distribution oriented. So we spent a, a year or so divesting those businesses. And that's how I ended up at Danaher. I had wanted to do something different, something smaller, run my own business. Uh, private equity was taken off. And this thing called Danaher just kept coming up. And finally, I met Phil Nisley. Many of you know Phil He's on the board of trustees here at Darden, really helped start the recruiting between Darden and Danaher. And he was impossible to turn down. And over that period of time, it's been a variety of businesses. In my now 12th year at Danaher, it's sort of eight years of industrial businesses, three plus years of healthcare and life science research businesses. And my experience as a general manager makes it such that I can simplify and help these businesses improve even without the intimate knowledge of the life science research. Now, I spent a lot of time talking to scientists and understanding you know, enough of the science that I need to to help improve and progress the business. But um, there are a handful of things that are relevant to any business from a standpoint of general management that I'll share with you. But first, I want to talk about Danaher a little bit. Not as a recruiting pitch, but because I can't imagine a better place to be a general manager than Danaher. Why is that? Danaher is a portfolio of 20 plus operating companies, all with a management team, a president, a CFO, a leader of HR. That team owns the strategy. That team owns the results every single month. That team owns the M&A strategy for the business. The thread that links all of these companies together is DBS and the Danaher business system, a set of business processes and tools that are applied a little bit differently in each business, but with the same goal in mind. 
And the diversity of the portfolio in Danaher is, is significant. We have four operating platforms, groups of businesses in some cases that are very closely related strategically, and other cases that are still quite diverse. But each one of these brands you see on the screen is not a brand, it's a company. Again, with a leadership team, a strategy, they own the results, and it's a, uh, it's a fabulous place to work. We've had good results for our shareholders over the years, and I put this chart up not to brag, but to really emphasize two points. What's behind those results is simply the summation of the individual businesses within Danaher. So uh, we tell our teams, every day, every month matters because it's part of the overall results of Danner. And secondly is, it's over a long period of time. We're very focused on the long term. We, we have sold some businesses over the years, but very few. We will acquire 10 to 15 companies in the course of a year to enhance the portfolio that we have. So we're very much about the long term, but we also recognize and appreciate and focus on that the way you deliver long term like this is delivering the short term every week, every month, every quarter. So we're, we're proud of that, and we also, one of our core values is we compete for shareholders. We take this obligation very seriously. Now, I know those of you that have been around Danaher have heard about the Danaher business system. Uh, let me just summarize it in, in two ways. First, it's our culture. It's how we think. It's how we work. Continuous improvement is one of our core values. And we have some businesses that put up some wonderful results and they are the same ones focused on getting better next year. So it's about a mindset and continuous improvement is at the heart and the core of that. Secondly, it's about a set of business processes and tools that any one of them, you could go on the internet and Google this afternoon, but it's how they get implemented and it's the time frame and the history with which they've been implemented that makes the difference. I like to say with lean or growth or the elements of, of the Danaher business system, progress is measured in decades. And many companies have started lean five years ago. Great. You know, 15 years from now, it'll be ingrained in their culture or not. It's a long-term game, and progress is really measured in decades. So as I said, Phil really got this Darden relationship started about 15 years ago. We hire MBAs every year inside Danaher, and it is definitely the case that our Darden grads do the best. And that's, I'm not objective, you can appreciate that. But I've had a number of folks who don't have an affiliation with an MBA program. In fact, a lot of them are Virginia Tech grads say, the Darden folks do best. Why? They fit in. They're humble. They work hard. They're broad thinkers. So we love the relationship we have with Darden, and we're, we're thrilled to be a part of this institution, and we're looking for people to run businesses for us down the road, and I hope some of you are here in that room. We have a strong alumni network. Some of them are with us here today. Several will be back over the course of the months ahead for some recruiting, and uh, yes, that was a recruiting pitch, but uh, we, we love our relationship with Darden. So, a little bit about myself a little bit about Danaher, what I've learned about general management over the years. And I may need some help. Mr. AV guy. Okay, while, while we're doing that, I do have a... There we go. I have always thought about general management in these three ways. First, you have to figure out how to sell. You have to figure out how to grow. Um, you have to, once you have a sale and growth, be able to improve margins to be able to reinvest in the business. But at the end of the day, the base of that triangle is all about leadership. Commercially, it starts with a business strategy. You can't just sell to anybody. You have to understand where is the market that you can grow the best in? How do you segment the market? Where can you create competitive advantage? Because if you don't have any competitive advantage, other folks are gonna sell and it's gonna become a commodity. 
Secondly is, I have learned some people have a growth mindset and some people don't. Some people spend all their time thinking about how can they sell what they have. Some people spend a lot of time thinking, man, if we just had that product, if we just had this, if we just had that, we could really sell. And it's the former and the growth mindset that matters a lot in the equation. Thirdly, it's not just about a mindset. You have to have some processes to help you segment the market, to manage sales forces, to stimulate demand, to market your positions. And there's a number of Danaher business system tools geared around commercial execution. And certainly critical in today's world is about innovation. And we spend a lot of time trying to make this very big fuzzy world called innovation actionable and tangible to our business. So I think the first set of skills you have to have at some point in your career is you have to be selling. You have to have a quota. You have to be understanding what customers need. You have to be able to deal with those objections. That is criteria number one. Secondly, as you, as you make a sale, you have to improve your business. Lean has been around for a long time, but it's still just as apt applicable today as it was 30 years ago. Today's world supply chain is critical. Um, just think back to the Japan earthquakes in 2011 or Puerto Rico today where we have a factory of 800 people in our Paul biopharmaceutical plant and we're flying, we're chartering planes to fly generator parts to suppliers to keep, try to get them running again. Supply chain, you're only as good as your supply chain in today's world. Logistics is increasingly an opportunity for distinction in the marketplace today. Back in my auto parts day, we used to deliver twice a week to Meineke stores, and no one else could do that. And that helped let us have 90% of the penetration of those, those accounts. Today's world, Amazon changing the game, and certainly technology, primarily the Internet of Things, and what is possible with the Internet of Things and connectivity and remote service and monitoring uh, incredibly valuable in the world today and ways to create distinction and advantage but certainly important skill sets I think for any successful gender manager to have. You can get them in many different ways. Are these the only things you need? Of course not. But I think those are really important for performance for customers, associates, and shareholders in the business. But again, the base of that is all about leadership. And as I said, teams have been a very important part of my life. Teams are important to be on, and it's important to be a good team member and to know how to do that. Because ultimately, you're, you have to lead teams. That's what being a general manager is about, whether it's a portfolio of companies or a single business. Being a leader of teams is the key ingredient for the success. I like to think of myself as on those teams when I'm in those business and working with and for those teams. And I think that's an important mindset as well. But ultimately it comes about building our teams for the future. Whether that's the future changes in the market, future growth, thinking forward and building teams not just for today but the, the future is really a key ingredient for leadership. Next, and I've learned this a couple of times in my career, becoming my own leader and who I am is really important. There are a few times in my career where I probably was taking on the personality of my boss who might have been a you know, pounder on the table or a yeller or a screamer. That's not me. That didn't work. Ultimately, I figured out my own leadership style and what works and stick to that. So I would encourage you in your leadership journey here at Dart and out in life is to find your own leadership style. Be comfortable with that and don't try to be somebody you're not. And certainly not just because of everything going on in the world today, but my experience in the last three years helping lead diversity and inclusion for Danaher has made it very obvious to me this is a critical ingredient for success. I talked about having a bunch of sisters, but the most significant thing I learned at Darden in 1990, and I'm really glad to see him up there, was in Alex Horniman's class. At the time, it was organizational behavior. 
And I told him at coffee, I really didn't enjoy his classes. I didn't like going, got a touchy-feely all over the place. You know, I wanted to get something done. But as I look back, by far, the most important subjects and the things I remember the most happened in his organizational behavior classes. And we had a week in 1990 where, again, the book Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus had just came out. And he gave us all a little toy that goes like this. And what we did for that week in class was when anybody said something that might be offensive to anybody in the room, this went off. <laughs> well, we didn't do anything for two days because this was going off all the time. Things like, hey, what are you guys going to do? People from Indiana are like, so for 26 years, this darn thing has been going off in my ears when people say something. But that was 26 years ago, long before diversity and inclusion was the topic that it was today. I think that's the most significant thing I learned at Darden, is how you communicate completely innocently in some ways has a huge impact on what people hear and how they act. So Alex, thank you very much. So the last three years at Danaher, like a lot of organizations, we've realized we have an opportunity. And I was tapped by the CEO at the time, Larry Culp, to lead this initiative. And I first thought, oh my gosh, what have I done? What have I, what, what did I do to deserve this? But I would tell you it's been one of the, if not the most rewarding experiences of my career. Because of the conversations I've been able to have, because of the thinking it's caused me to do, and because of the opportunity that's ahead. So diversity and inclusion, I know that is a term and a phrase that gets passed around a lot. I think they're two very different things. Diversity, we, we like to say at Danaher, less is more, not around diversity, but all the things you can do in a business. With diversity, clearly, more is more. There are lots of types of diversity. They're all important. But most importantly, diverse teams do better. I think that's been scientifically proven. I think that makes common sense. If you and I are working towards the same objective and we've got different points of view and we're going to debate and discuss, I think we're going to get in a better place. And in today's world where innovation is as critical as it's ever been, it has been proven diverse teams often create more innovative solutions. But frankly, diversity is one of those things you can see, you can measure, I don't want to say it's easy because it's not. In fact, it's far from being easy. But I think inclusion is the real challenge and the real opportunity. And it's the real key to long-term success. We spend a lot of time at Danaher helping to improve associate engagement. And I just can't imagine what it might be like to come to a place of work not feeling like you belong, not feeling like you're a part of the team, and being engaged. Uh, in inclusion is about recognizing people's full capabilities, letting them know they're valued, and ultimately helping them and therefore the organization realize its full potential. So we are in the journey. We have 25 plus operating companies, all at different stages, but all are trying to do a couple of things. One is to understand how it can help improve and drive their business. Our dental business, for example, 70% of the graduates in dental schools around the world are female. That means in some cases we need to design handpieces and workstations better. Uh, we need to market differently. Um, innovation is different in those businesses. But it's not just about the business case. It's the right thing to do but taking our businesses beyond discussion and awareness into action and improvement is where we are today, and I'm confident that's where we'll remain for many years. I have said I think diversity and inclusion is as important to organizations today as lean manufacturing was in the late 1980s. And what I mean by that is those companies that embraced it prospered. Those companies that didn't 
Many of them are not around. And I think the same is about building teams with diversity and inclusion today. So it's had a big impact on me. I'm confident we'll be working on it 20 years from now. But we are convinced that diverse teams do better, and it's the right thing to do. So a handful of things, and I definitely want to save some time for questions here. This is about building teams. It's about effective communication. And it's not just me talking like I'm doing right now. It's about listening. I spend a lot of time at various levels of the organization talking to individuals about their current job, their career ambitions, and how things are going. That helps me see the broader organization. That helps us develop people. I spend a lot of time listening. I think God gave me two ears and one mouth. I try to use those in that proportion. I think as a general manager, you have to be agile. You have to be able to go broad and look, at, look above the landscape, but you also have to be able to go deep into a subject. In my first role as a general manager in France, still my favorite job ever, 50 million in sales. One day I had to be the salesperson, the next day I had to be the operations leader. That's what makes it fun. But you have to be able to go both deep and wide. We talk about humility and confidence at Danner. The humility part is there is always somebody out there looking to disrupt, looking to take our business, and we have to be humble about who we are and where we are. But by the same token, we can be confident and should be confident, and it's the balance between those two that I think are important for any general manager. Um, I think as a general manager, you have to have the balance between persuasion and authority. Persuasion often works a lot better than authority, but sometimes you are the only person in the room and that can make a decision, and you need to make it. Coming back and saying, well, we'll think about it, we'll get back to you, there are times when you have to make a decision. And you're going to be wrong. Change, you can deal with that. But persuasion works a lot better than authority. But don't ever forget, there are times when you are the only one that can make that decision. So make it and deal with the, uh, deal with the consequences. Honesty and candor. I think people need to hear what things are going well, when things are not going well. The way I like to say when things aren't going well, we can do better. But don't sugarcoat things. If things aren't going well, the organization has to understand it. And then let's have a conversation about what we're going to do differently. Being a teacher and a student, especially with the Nanahar Business System, spent a lot of time talking with new organizations and new companies about how it's worked and what it means and uh, you know, what it's not. And, you know, also have to be a student of continuous improvement and learning from our own people, learning from our own organization. I think that's a balance that's really important in being general manager as well. I've talked about diversity and inclusion, just appreciating that people have different perspectives. They have things to add to the conversation and listening well goes a long way. Passion and hard work. Hey, nothing in life comes without hard work. Don't ever mistake that. But passion is what fuels hard work. And make no mistake, your organization will know if you're going through the motions or you are on board side by side with them, working hard to help them not just improve their business, but develop their career and progress. And lastly, is I don't think you can expect your organization to have a balanced life unless you have a balanced life yourself. Now, your balanced life and my balanced life may be two completely different things. It's an individual thing, and I always stress that when I, I get the question all the time. You know, how do you, how do you balance your life? How do you do things? You know what? I, I do it with the help of my, my wife and my family. We make it work. But the, what works for me is going to be different than you. But I really think part of the engagement is around a balanced life. I don't think you can expect your teams to have a balanced life unless you do. And it doesn't happen every day. But over time, it does. So be your own leader. These are things from my experience that I think are important, that have certainly helped me. But there is no straight line path to general management. There are lots of ways to get there. My advice to you is when you get the opportunity, jump on it. Mine happened on a Saturday morning back in 1996. I've had 21 years of fun as a general manager. I'm still doing it, and I wouldn't trade a thing. A couple of lessons about the, the business in general. 
market first. Markets set the parameters. If you're a good operator in a bad market, guess what? The market's going to win over time. Market selection is really critical. Strategy is important. Execution is absolutely just as important. Uh, I can't remember the military leader that said it, but an average battle plan violently executed will defeat a perfect battle plan with average execution 100% of the time. And I certainly believe that. And ultimately, it's about how do you build competitive, sustainable advantage. Gross margins is one of the barometers of a marketplace. Gross margins are important because it allows you to reinvest. If you're in a 30% gross margin business, you can make a good living at that, but you're not going to be able to have 20% sales and marketing and 10% R&D and have a sustainable enterprise. You're going to run out of money. Gross margins matter a lot. One of the things I've learned at Danaher is the power of expectations. Setting a high bar for the team goes a long way. And it's not just, hey, let's have a higher target, but let's, let's see what winning looks like and let's help with the processes that help us get there. It's like the New England Patriots. They expect to win the Super Bowl every year. Like them or not, they do a pretty good job at that. They've got pretty high expectations. There are lots of things you can do in a business, but as a general manager, helping the organization understand the handful of critical things that are going to make the most difference for your customers, your associates, and your shareholders is one of the most important things you can do as a general manager. What I've seen fail a lot is folks trying to do too much. Go to Gimba. Those of you who aren't familiar with that word, that means in the market where things happen, where the work is done. Go see customers, go to your plants, get out, go to Gimba, that's where your answers really lie. And ultimately, again, leadership is what determines success. Lastly, what are you gonna do out of here? Hopefully get a job. Secondly, pick the organization, not the first role. I know the statistics today say you all are gonna have 10 different jobs with 10 different organizations over your career, that may be the case. But I think the first couple you pick really focus on the organization. And is it the opportunity that you have to grow and develop? Is it the kind of organization with the culture and the integrity and the leadership that you believe in? If so, very confident good things can happen over time. This is a long-term game. It's not the next couple of years. It's the next 30 years. Be flexible. There'll be a curveball that comes your way. Jump on it when you can, especially when that first general management assignment comes to you. Get out in the world. We're in a global world today. Lifelong learning. Utilize advisors and mentors. I've done that throughout my whole career, and I don't think I've ever called one of them a mentor. They're just people at all levels in the organization that have a lot of experience and learning. And again, listening a lot goes a long way. And lastly, pursue your dreams. So. Hopefully that's helpful. Hopefully there have been a couple of things you can take with you over the next couple of years as you embark on your journey of a general manager. And with that, Elliot, we're going to open it up for some questions. Questions and then we'll attempt to answer them. Yes, please. Um, that's a great question. There, there's one thing that we measure and lots of organizations do, that's associate engagement, where we have some specific questions around inclusion. Um, but I think you only know with conversations with people, with things like your retention rate of an organization. Um, so it's, it's not like there's one or two metrics, but it's really about what's the culture of the organization. Do people feel like their point of view is valued, respected, and rewarded? And that's not always easy to measure. We have microphones, I think, so speak into the microphone, So as Martin pointed out, you're a white guy. How, how have you helped your teams realize that, import, that diversity and inclusion are important for you? and they don't say, well, you're a white guy, you don't know how it feels. How have you managed that? So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, we had lunch together with Martin, and that was his last question. I said, hey, I'm gonna share my story. Uh, as you can tell, I've always been a white guy. I don't know anything different. Um, your question was, you know, how, how has that impacted how I lead? And, you know, I, as I said, in, in, in the last few years, I have had incredible conversations with individuals that start with two ways. One, 
What's it like to be a female or fill in the blank here at Danaher? Secondly, what do you think we need to do differently? Those conversations have run incredible and been incredibly insightful for me. So it's conversation, it's listening. Um, I'm not a one-man band at this. We've got a diversity council of 20 people representing many forms of diversity from many of our different businesses who, frankly, we spent 18 months just figuring out what was important for us to begin with. Today, it's about our 25 operating companies figuring out how they're going to help their own business by driving more diversity and inclusion. So I wish there were a magic button to push. I've heard the easy button here uh, at Darden this morning in some conversation. There's no easy button for this. Some of it's going to take a long time. But beginning with conversation, enhancing awareness of the organization, that's a good place to start. But as I said, we are pushing our businesses to get beyond conversation and awareness and into action. And uh, that just can't happen too quickly. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a while for any organization. Yes, please. Uh, if you could wait for the microphone to come down. Hi, you haven't addressed motivation specifically. Um, what are your best tools for um, increasing motivation? Um, that's a great question. Um, first of all, we have businesses that are doing incredible things. And I actually, on the DBS slide at the bottom, I neglected to mention that. We realized about five years ago that the organizations were not motivated by improved growth, profitability, solely motivated by improved gro growth, profitability, cash flow, all those kind of things. Increasingly in the world, it was making a difference. And today, Danaher is a science and technology company providing products and solutions for researchers developing cures for cancer, for dental practitioners, helping people not just straighten their teeth, but get confidence. That is the single biggest motivation that we have today. Obviously, there are financial motivations as well, and we are a collection of businesses with one stock price called DHR. We work hard to improve that. But I would tell you today, the vast majority of the motivation inside our organization comes from making a difference through our business in the lives of patients or our customers. And I, for one, have just been blown away by the impact of that over the last few years. Yes, sir. Um, so I appreciate your answer to that question. As a follow-up, before you worked in an automotive company, so how did you motivate people if what you were making didn't save lives? Yeah, that's also a very good question. Um, I'd say in those days it was more about how do we serve customers and how do we improve our business. Um, you know, cars are important. We need our cars to get to work. We need our cars to get to the doctor. And our, our side of the business was about how do you get parts so that when you take your car, it's fixed in an hour and you don't have to wait a week or go back because guess what? You need your car tomorrow. So it's a, it was really that customer dynamic that really helped us improve Embrace Lean because there was no way we were going to sell 30,000 auto parts uh, next day without being really good at that. So it was a customer motivation, but hey, any business you have, you can make, bit, make better. And recruiting, developing, and, and retaining people that are looking to make a business better, that can happen in any, any industry. And those are the kinds of people you want on your team. Yes, we have a question there in the center. Can you uh, start a point, excuse me? <laughs> Now you can't do that. Is this a cold call? Thanks a lot, Dan, for sharing. Um, I'm also curious uh, regarding, you mentioned that your first job out of Darden was uh, uh, helping to improve the manufacturing of mufflers. So what steps did you take to improve the pr production from, say, 10,000 to 12,000? 12, uh, 12, I was so fortunate in 1991 to get introduced to the Toyota production system 
And for those of you that have been around, once you go through that, there's no going back. There's no change. So we were in the automotive industry, pretty competitive. Um, Toyota was the way you got better. And it started out with a toothbrush and cleaning off machines and painting them and you know, creating a better work environment. And then through things like books like The Goal, a classic, and understanding where the bottlenecks were in the production process. And yes. <laughs> Understanding where production bottlenecks are and resolving those, that, that, that's how you get better. But uh, again, once you get that in your blood, there's, there's no getting it out. And it's, it's been the same at Danaher when we've taken that as the foundation of DBS and taken it into growth processes and, and doing similar th activities and improvements with, with sales organizations and, and R&D and innovation organizations. So once, it, when, once, you, once you get it, there's, there's no shaking it. So, so, Dan, here's your, your cold call. Uh, first of all, my, my one comment is the curriculum hasn't changed in 25 years since Good. these people are all still reading the goal. Good. So they're supposed to be reading the goal. Uh, <laughs> I want to combine the last two questions. Uh, many of the people in this room are applying for the, this year, you said since 2006 we've partnered with these Kaizen, so their applications are due this evening at midnight, by the way, to remind you. Uh, so they're going to learn uh, DBS, Danaher uh, Business System, at the Gemba at different, lo uh, different places around the world. Uh, there's uh, diversity within, uh, within the organization, obviously. There's diversity also from one location to another to another. What, uh, what in DBS has to be tailored to a specific location or specific culture? So, uh, uh, I call it cultural Kaizen. Does the Kaizen, the continual improvement process, change from Brazil to Greensboro to Finland, for example? Well, first, whether it's lean, DBS, whatever you want to call it, it works in every single business there is, every single culture there is, every single country there is. There's just no doubt about it whatsoever. Now, they're not all in the same place. All are at different stages of execution and implementation but it's about continuous improvement and getting better. And if we stay focused on that and not try to do too many things at once, do the three or four things really well, it happens equally good around the world in all kinds of different businesses. We haven't seen a business yet where it doesn't have dramatic impact. So um, it, it works, it's about continuous improvement and focus on a critical few priorities. And I hope, all of you, although I don't think you've got that many spots, will join Elliot in the, in the Darden Kaizen in Finland in March. It's been a wonderful 11 years. I know we've been to India, we've been to Switzerland, we've been to Charlotte, been to some other places, and we're in Finland in March. And that's the best way to experience a few minutes I shared with you about Danaher. And, and whether you want to work at Danaher or not, that learning from that I, I know can help you throughout the rest of your career. We have time for one more question, if there is one. Uh, so thanks for share, sharing so much. Uh, my question is, uh, when we graduated from uh, Darren, uh, maybe we are not very good at, uh, very sophisticated at uh, people management skills, and we don't have very expertized in the industry. We don't have so much uh, industry uh, insights. So how can we quickly to contribute to the team and to bring, um, to establish our authority? Thanks. Um, well, first of all, I'd say, repeat a couple things I've said. Quickly doesn't happen. It happens over a long period of time with experiences. Um, authority is not something you're given, it's something you earn. And um, I, I like to think leading teams and building teams and helping teams achieve more than perhaps they could do individually that's a great way to build authority. But I would say you all are embarking on a leadership journey over the next few years that eventually is going to become who you are as a leader and the style that works for you. Very few of you are going to go off and be a general manager early on in your career. 
you have to go through a whole variety of experiences. It's a journey worth taking, uh, and you are in a wonderful place to begin that journey, and I wish you all the best of luck. So thank you for coming out today. Best of luck to you.